I'm Hulk Hogan, the greatest wrestler of all time. <laughs> the truth behind the curtain. <laughs> yeah, so I'm like the Wizard of Oz right now. Or, or this could be a confession booth. Uh huh. Yeah. So if you have to, any sins you want to confess, I'm well, here for you. Go ahead. Let's let's hear what you got. I know you have some confessions. I've got too many sins to 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 spout <laughs> out in one podcast, man. <laughs> Cool. So are we officially on? What's what's going on? Yeah, I'm on now. I don't. I'm not doing anything live. I'm just recording now, and then I'll cut it up later if I need to. Cool. Um, all right, cool. So I'll just start with the intro then. Um. Okay. So welcome to the famous when I'm dead podcast, where we talk with artists about what it takes to be uh, to gain notoriety and be successful while you're still above ground. I'm here with my pal Nolan. Co-founder of Over the Line Art, former president and current board member of the International Society of Caricature Artists, and WrestleManiac. Oh yeah, you know it. Works with clients like WWE, Marvel, mm -hmm. Tops, and just an uh, overall uh, fun guy, uh, great American songbird, Nolan Harris, everybody. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what songs I've written are, are of note, but uh, you know I'm still trying. I've got I've actually got a track list of uh -huh. potential songs. Really? Yeah, some of them I can't really talk about on here. I, I think it might turn <laughs> off your your uh, your viewing audience, but yeah, yeah, one day it's gonna happen. Or maybe it'll turn them on. You don't know. I mean, you don't know who's don't, watching. This is R and D time right now. <laughs> <laughs> you are in the basement with a black curtain behind you. <laughs> My confession booth, man. What can I say? I've got, I've got my, I've got my beautiful black curtain. I've got my beautiful black dog down here. You want to say hi to Sam? Mm -hmm. This is Dwayne. You probably can't even see him. Oh, hey, Dwayne Johnson. Yeah. He is. Looks good. Yeah, you know he's hanging in there. Quarantine has not been kind to his fur. What do you mean? So I, well, you know he grows, he grows fur like at a crazy rate. Oh. And he can't get a haircut right now professionally, so I've been his stylist. Oh, man. So send your prayers out for Nolan's dog, for Dwayne. Him, me, uh, I don't look too great either. That's why I'm wearing a hat. <laughs> You're always wearing a hat, though, right? Yeah, people make fun of me for it because I have, like, you know, luscious, full, thick hair. Yeah. No bald. Well, I have kind of have a bald spot from when I try to cut my hair. It's like an ice cream scoop up there, man. It is. It's looking what good. flavor would this be? Uh, charcoal. Oh, yeah. That's what the hipsters are doing nowadays, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Like burned coconut. That's like a flavor oh, here in Prague. Vegan, of course. Uh, yeah. always. It's always the vegans that are doing that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I really appreciate you having me on here, Sam. I thank you for the intro. Uh there's one amendment I have to make to it. Okay. So I'm currently not a board member of ISCA. Oh, they I, kicked you out? They should have kicked me out years ago, but I, uh, fortunately for them, I kicked myself out. Oh, okay. um, no, I'm an executive board member, so... <laughs> oh, I see. Like, okay. It's <laughs> not nearly as important as it sounds. Uh, essentially, when you are a president and you uh, leave, you are... Um, uh, anointed as a member of the executive board by the standing president. I believe it's five former presidents or members, but we're just pretty much here to kind of like lend a hand, mm -hmm. give assistance, advice, you know, whatever we need to do to help the president and, and the current board mm -hmm. uh, just kind of get off on the right foot. So you guys, like when we do a cryptocurrency, it'll be like Nolan coin? Or... Oh, no, 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 no. no. <laughs> I'm not going to be a part of that. Again. <laughs> Too risky? <laughs> So, uh, yeah, so uh, I just, 
I want to keep it kind of loose and just chat. Um, we do have a couple of entries um, that we'll go over at the end, but the way I like to start it off is just to talk about your journey as an artist and kind of how you got into caricature and um, we kind of lead into business and kind of how that's going now. But I like to just talk about like, you know, how we got started and um, yeah, so I'll just let you take it away. Uh, so my, my caricature journey began, it actually began in 97, 1997. I was 16. I was working at a theme park in Cincinnati, Ohio, and it's called King's Island. And it was kind of a hotbed for Commons Art Shops, which is a concessionaire, uh, art, entertainment, retail company out of Ohio. They're huge, yeah. They're all, yeah, they're huge. They're all over the place. Uh, so my journey began in 97. I was working as a games operator. Huh, Alani had the same same start. Yeah, well, I, I actually worked with Alani. Oh, that's right, that's uh, right. In Chicago, way back when. But yeah, I, I was working games, and there was a caricature stand right across from the, the three-point shot game that I was working at. And I would just always watch the artists, and I'd watch the interactions, and I would see the stuff they were doing. And I actually befriended a few of them, and one of them showed me the old ISCA, at the time it was the NCN, mm -hmm. uh, the old newsletter, not not magazine, yeah. but like an old school newspaper that they would get quarterly. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, you know, I draw, and you know, as most artists, when they see a guy working the basketball three-point shot game, they're like, oh yeah, yeah, of course you draw. Yeah. <laughs> Let's see what you do. And so I just did like a loose doodle, you know, something off the top of my head. I don't remember what it was, but they were like, oh my God, yeah, you're actually, you're not bad. Um, you should apply. So I applied, I was 16 at the time, and at Kings Island, I think they only had two caricature stands and maybe six caricature artists total. Hmm. So they just couldn't accommodate me at the time, and then I, I held out uh, until the next year. And I applied again, and once again, uh, they said, you know, we're full. We can't bring anyone else on. So then, fast forward to 1999, I'm 18, just out of uh, high school, and I apply again. I, I didn't stop. Uh, I had a full portfolio of all of my Star Wars Episode One fan art. <laughs> and I was like, yeah, this is Jar Jar Binks. This guy is going to, like, change the world. Uh, he's going to be the greatest character ever. So you liked uh, Jar Jar Binks at the time? Uh, people didn't know because the movie didn't come out yet. Oh, <laughs> I see. Okay. I think I, I think I applied I think I think applied in, like, late March, early April. So it was before the movie had officially released. So you got lucky. So, yeah. uh, little did I know that that, was, that wasn't going to pan out, but... Um, Needless to say, they, they finally hired me on, and I started drawing caricatures, and I was trained by a really fantastic artist named Quincy Sutton. Hmm. He, uh, he's worked with Manny Abitizian. He has worked with uh, a guy named Jeremy Miller, who is, uh, he runs all the special events for Commons Art Shops out of, out of uh, Chagrin Falls. Hmm. But uh, Quincy taught me a lot about you know interacting with people, uh, he taught me a lot about speed, you know, how to, how to create a concise, fast drawing. Uh, he really taught me a lot about the, uh, hustling aspect. Mm -hmm. And when I say hustling, I know people that aren't in our realm initially think, oh, you're, you're like trying to like cheat somebody out of something or whatever, but hustling for a caricature artist is how can you bring in a customer? How can you bring someone in, generate interest? Uh, in, in our case, it was how to get a girl's phone number, um, which that was one of our fun challenges back then. I was 18, so um, you know nowadays I think you just what you just give them your you just swipe. Oh, you just swipe. Yeah, right? just swiping. Phone. Yeah. Wow. Times have changed, but anyways, um, that's how I got my start drawing characters. I I started in theme parks, uh, so you know I know as you know. From going to the convention, you've interacted with people that start in theme parks, but you've also seen the other side of the coin, people that are influenced by seeing artists online or, mm -hmm. you know, seeing professional level character artists that do illustrations and stuff. 
uh, my path was through theme parks. So that's how I got my start. Let me know if I'm rambling, by the way. No, you're good. Okay. Um, after that, you know, I was I was I was going to college in uh, Savannah, Georgia, studying 2D animation, and then I kind of segued into illustration, and I would just go back to the theme park for a summer job. But I realized I really loved it. I really liked it. I really enjoyed the interaction. So and was so there a point college. where you decided that you were going to do that as opposed to go into animation? Well, here's the thing. So to be frank with you, when you're in college, I mean, you're only in your tw early 20s. Uh, to, to meet someone that knows where they're going to go for the rest of their life at that age, to me, is kind of weird. Mm -hmm. And so when I was going to school at SCAD, Savannah College of Art and Design, I was kind of shoehorned into picking a major and I wanted to pick something that was the most in line with what I liked. Mm -hmm. So caricature, animation. I mean, a lot of the character design you see in animation is, is, is direct, derived from caricature. Mm -hmm. um, but as I would meet and interact with folks in the animation industry and I would kind of see what the work environment was like, it, it kind of hit me that that wasn't really going to be the best fit for me. I didn't like being stuck in a cubicle or in a studio space. I liked being out with the people. Mm -hmm. And I really liked interacting. I'm a, I'm a type A. You know, mm -hmm. I, I, I like to talk to people. Uh, so, you know, I, much to my parents' chagrin, and probably a lot of people in my family, I said, hey, you know, I want to pursue this caricature thing. And I want to see where I can take it. And so I just kind of, I traveled around with commons uh, to different theme parks. Uh, at first I was overseeing, uh, the stands as a supervisor. So I did that in, uh, Richmond, Virginia. And then I got promoted to be a full-time manager up in Chicago, which is where I worked with Alani. Mm -hmm. And then after that, I hopped from Chicago over to Columbus, Ohio, which Ohio is my home state. So it seemed like it'd be a natural fit. And then after that, I just, you know, it, it, it didn't really feel like I was getting enough time behind the easel. And even when I did get time behind the easel, it wasn't the right setting for me. Uh, it wasn't very busy. Um, the, I was, it was at a zoo at the time. So you get kind of tired of drawing, you know, elephants yeah. flamingos and stuff like that after a while. So this was a full-time job for you at this point, like as soon as you left college. Yeah, yeah. So when I left college initially, I had to really, you know, kind of grind down and, and kind of prove my worth with the company. Mm -hmm. So initially, it was a seasonal position, and then when I got out of Virginia, you know, they felt like I'd really kind of shown what I can do, and then they offered me a full time position. So it was it was year round. The theme parks were seasonal, but then during the off season, you know, I would do like graphic design work or I'd help out where they still had operations that were open. But then after that, it's just kind of like, you know, it became more of a corporate deal for me. I became more of like, a, instead of just overseeing caricatures, I was overseeing caricatures, face painting, photography, ride photography. And and when you look at the numbers, you're like, oh man, photography is making way more than caricatures. They really want me to focus more on that. Yeah. You kind of see that your trajectory is not going in the direction you want it to. And so... Do you mean in the sense like, in the sense of like you're becoming more of a business manager than you are an artist? Yeah, yeah. Like I'm I'm going from interacting and hiring college level artists that want to pursue this as a career to hiring, you know, 15, 16 year old kids that can snap people's photo when they walk into the theme park or the yeah. zoo in this yeah. case. And and having to manage those kids and like having to manage the people that manage those kids because mm. when you're at the top of this you know this little chain this pyramid of you know management you have to delegate all that stuff down to people that really in most cases aren't ready for it mm. um because of the setting you're working in so i kind of it kind of wore on me after a while um my last year with commons was during the recession and interestingly enough, I already put in my notice 
uh, to leave, I called up the owner, Rich Common, at the time, and I said, hey, you know, I'm, I'm, I think I'm going to be leaving. And, uh, and then I said, you know what, I'm going to give it one more year just to kind of see how the economy goes, but I'm just giving, I'm giving you one year notice. And so that's kind of how it happened, how it ended. And then uh, my, my buddy, Dexter, who I've worked with uh, years prior, he moved out to Seattle probably in 2007, 2008. And he was, he was doing really well for himself out there. And, you know, he kept calling me just to check in, see how things were going. And I would tell him, oh, well, you know, this job kind of sucks. And he'd keep telling me, just move out here, man. Let's start something together. Let's, like, actually build something. Yeah. And When was so, that? When did you guys start? Uh, so we officially started Over the Line in 2010. Okay. But there was a different iteration of it that we started in Ohio, I want to say, in 2006. Uh, it was called Over the Line Productions, hmm. and when when Dexter and I left that, uh, it was continued on by Eric Smith. Okay, he's a, an artist out of Ohio, and, and to this day, he's still Over the Line Productions. And then Dexter and I decided we wanted to kind of separate ourselves, but we loved the name, mm -hmm. and you know we'd already built a following with that name, so we kind of saw it as okay, well, we can be Over the Line Productions West. Eric can be Overline Productions East, mm -hmm. and you know whatever Eric does out there, that's all him. Whatever we make out here, that's all us. But eventually, there's just like a little bit too too much confusion, mm -hmm. so we decided to rebrand, uh, rename ourselves Overline Art because we were it was more conducive of what, where we were headed at the time. And so we did the trademark. You know, we got the the copyright and on the name and all that. Oh, nice. And. Uh, and then that's how we became Over the Line Art. Hmm. So it's been 10 years now. What what an anniversary. What a 10-year anniversary. Yeah, right. So God. actually, um, that brings up a question for me because there's this thing. Your experience is a little different. But for me, um, I, my career, let's say like business career, was in sales and um, marketing and mainly sales, though, indoor sales, inside sales. And I became pretty good at that over like the seven years that I did it. Let's say nine years because I had a separate job that still involved that. And one of the things that I struggle to kind of like find balance with is like becoming a better artist and being a businessman. Right. So um, I guess that's, I have a couple of questions about that. I guess the, the first question would be is like, when did you know, or was there a point where you kind of realized like, man, I like live caricature, but now it's time for me to start training people and I'll do just my studio practice or like, I don't know. What was your experience with that? Like balancing business and like artistic growth. It, it was kind of hard for a while because I think in the, the latter years of my commons experience, I strayed further away from doing live caricature, but I would still do caricature for the sake of caricature, like uh, out of my house, you know, like um, to grow to grow myself artistically. Were you but doing digital think, back then too? No, no, it was that was around 2008. Uh, so I was doing traditional. I would draw traditionally. I would uh, take a photo of it, or I would scan it, and then I'd touch it up digitally. Mm. Um, you know, like I'd add like certain lighting elements or background elements or whatnot. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, my philosophy and to this day, it's still the same. You, you have to be art first, no matter what. I mean, there are lots of successful business people out there that are not art first mm -hmm. and that's totally cool. You know, that's, that's what they do. My mm -hmm. philosophy is I'm, I, I've always still been to this day art first. Um, which is why you see me cranking stuff out all the time. Yeah. But um, I think I think there was a while there where the business kind of took the the front seat, and the art was kind of in the in the in the rear view for a little bit. But um, when when we're training, for example, um, I, I this is I I feel like the art first part kind of comes out because when we're training, we're trying to like promote that enthusiasm for the art form. Mm -hmm. 
which isn't always the case when you're being trained in a theme park environment. It's usually very regimented. But when Dexter and I are doing it, we're, we're very pro-passion. We're very much talking about our influences, and mm -hmm. we're talking about the world that, that we all live in as caricature artists. Mm -hmm. And I think building that enthusiasm during the training process really kind of spills over into when they start to do retail, kind of once they work out the jitters, yeah. you know. Um, but <clears throat> art, I'm, still, I'm still art first to this day. You know, I mean, I, I can still work the hell out of a spreadsheet and do payroll, but I'm still drawing, man. I'm still, I'm still plugging away. Yeah, I mean, that was a, I was looking into getting into like a, a European-wide booking business. Uh, about two and a half, three years ago, and it started to kind of get more serious, and I was moving moving closer to like actually uh, kind of just um, jumping into it all the way. And someone said something to me that basically was like, "You can either you can either like go with the art thing, or you can go with the business thing," and that was enough to scare me away from the business thing because I'm like, man, I, I, the, the, my passion lies whenever I see art that blows me away or that I'm impressed with. Like, that's what motivates me. That's where my motivation comes from. So I backed away from that and just continued to work with my business, like per, personally with my business because I can still do the business thing with me and maybe a couple of partners, but when it comes to like a European wide booking system, like, yeah, I would probably make a lot more money, but it's like, I wouldn't have no time for my own artistic development. Yeah. Yeah. I think about the end game. I mean, yeah, it's nice to be comfortable. You know, it's nice to, to make money. I mean, I, I, but first of all, it's terrible advice. Whoever gave that to you, that's, that's, it's horrific that someone would say that to you. Yeah, they, they kind of gave they kind of said it in a way that was like you can go this way or that way. Um, what the fuck do they know? Yeah, yeah, I won't say any names. I won't even say the way <laughs> the way he said it to me because uh, I don't want to I don't want to like give the clue. But but yeah, I mean, I realize that that business can still be a part of it and art can still come first, and that's. Anyway, that's what kind of scared me away from like working with that particular individual. But, um, yeah, it's it's um, you know, running a booking operation is it, it is a lot of work, and I, we're very fortunate in the respect that most of that work uh, usually comes during the summertime and during the winter time. Mm -hmm. You know, we there's it, it, but it directly corresponds with our retail season. Mm -hmm. So we're already like guns a blazing. Like we're already like out there drawing at the Space Needle, at the waterfront, at festivals, fairs and whatnot. And then these bookings start to come in and we just kind of funnel that into the work schedule. We're just mm -hmm. like, okay, who's not working here, here and here okay. today? Let's give it to this person. Or, oh shit, everyone's working. Let's reach out to a contractor that you know we work with every now and then and see if they they want to take it on. Mm -hmm. But you know, the national stuff, it's, it's, I mean, for Europe, you, you'd kind of be the first of your kind, mm -hmm. but I don't know how it works with all the different countries and, and, you know, how payments and I just don't know how all that would work out, but, uh, it, it would be a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, maybe something on a smaller scale, you know, so you can still have your cake and eat it too. Yeah, we'll probably start something. We have uh, Chance McGee, we have Paul Evanese, and uh, Valta Klintz here. So, yeah. And then we have the Austrian crew, but they kind of got their own thing going on. But we have a, a couple of Americans and other expats in, sort of centered in this region that might want to do something. But the thing about uh, expats and um, Europeans is like there's a lot of uh, like fierce independence. So yeah. there's... It's hard to kind of like work together, especially if you're in different countries. And Chance and Paul, they work in Germany, so they're speaking German with their customers, and I'm speaking right. Czech, and I don't really speak German, and they don't speak Czech, so like that that language thing is kind of messes it up. But that's actually one of the things that um, that attracted me so much toward caricature because I went to an art school that was like very conceptual, and it was very much like 
you know, they didn't teach me hardly anything about like the technical side or draftsmanship. Um, and then I also had the experience with, uh, you know, being in business. And then I had a hot dog vending business. Nobody oh, beat really? Hot City Franks. Nobody beats this meat. That was my logo. Dude, <laughs> that's like my favorite thing in the world. You can ask anybody. Hot like, dogs. Nolan, Nolan's obsessed with hot dogs. Oh yeah. <laughs> hot dogs. I got, I got a, I got a dog out here whining at me. I'm just gonna throw him up into the. Go ahead. The main level. Okay. I'm gonna throw him on the grill. <laughs> Get out of here, Tony. All right. Sorry about that. Yeah, no problem. Um. So anyway. What I was saying was, is that I had this experience with like working on the street, like with kind of like freaks and geeks. I mean, the, the avenue was Washington Avenue and it divided the city into like kind of the, the poor and the rich, rich white professional and the get, and it was just like a melting, literally like a melting pot in that neighborhood. It was like people from all different demographics and it was late at night. So there was like a bar for, for, um, for African-American people then there's a bar, like a strip club, and then there's like a sports fan bar, and it was like all the bars for every kind of person, you know. Even, I mean, there were like transvestites and gangsters, and like, it, it was so cool, man. It was like such an awesome, awesome experience. But I had that experience working on the street and like being an entrepreneur. And then um, I also had the experience of being just like totally disgusted with like this like nose raised, like conceptual art bullshit. And I, I was just like, I found caricature. I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. I like get to make fun of people. I get to be out on the street. I can also like use my business sense with this. This is like perfect for that. So yeah, that's kind of how I fell in love with it. That's awesome, man. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's kind of, I, I love hearing people's stories about how they got into it because everyone's got their own little, their own little tale about how caricature is, is something that like focuses them because of its like weird nature. Yeah. You know, it's like, um, I'm a, I'm a fucking weirdo, you know? And that, that's why I'll never not love caricature. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, yeah, man, like I definitely can relate to you on the interactivity and, uh, and, and just being with the people and, you know, commercial art, it, it is what it is, you know, but fine art, I've definitely seen the good and the bad, you know, that comes from that world, that realm, which is why I think so many artists are happy they have management Yeah. to kind of deal with the bullshit and then they can just focus on making good art. Yeah. But, um, yeah, right on. Yeah, I had a, another question about that, but I'm totally drawing a blank on it right now. I think Alani's interview kind of like drained the life out of me. <laughs> oh shit. <laughs> yeah. Um what was the fucking question, man? You just asked me all the questions you asked him, it's cool. Yeah. No. <laughs> um Oh yeah, that's what it was. So yeah, I wanted to talk about because about business and art, because we have a as caricature artists, we have kind of like a unique experience with that in the sense that like the art is like more important yeah but the business is also like important and a lot of artists kind of have to manage that on their own anyway um mm -hmm. obviously we have people like you and other people who have like agencies or our businesses that 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 manage a lot of that stuff for us but um if we want to keep going with it generally we tend to tend to have to get involved with the business end of it some uh, somehow so i guess i just wanted to talk about or see if you had anything to say to not just caricature artists, but other people who are artists that are like terrified of the business side of it. Right. You know, I've seen, I've seen both ends of the coin. Like I have friends that are near and dear to me that barely touch the business side of it and are still doing really, really well for themselves. Mm. Um, given it's a regional thing, you know, there's, there's different parts of, of the United States that are going to be much more busy and, and, you know, bolstering with business than others. But I mean, I have friends that they don't even issue contracts, you know, they're just like, yeah, I'll be there. It's going to be 300 an hour. And they're like, all right. And then boom, they're, they're good, you know, but, um, 
But then on the other side of it, you know, it is important to like understand, you know, the power of having a contract, the power of deposits, um, except how to accept payment, you know, in a way where the, the customer feels like it's secure and that they're with a trusted company or a trusted contractor or business, whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, a lot of, a lot of the artists that work for me, um, given, I usually kind of the benefit of them being employed by me and Dexter is that we do all that for them. Mm-hmm. So I think there's a lot of comfort in that. And I think that some artists are willing to make that concession of, okay, I might make a little less if I'm not doing it on my own. So someone else can do it for me. Yeah. Get, kind of getting back to having a manager. Yeah. When you're an artist, like we deal with all the bullshit. So the artist can just do what they do best. Yeah. Um, but for like other people that are kind of making their way in the business, I wouldn't be too scared about the business aspect because um, you're, everyone you're usually working for has been a caricaturist at one point in time. So they can kind of tell you the things that they've experienced. They can tell you the things that they've seen. Uh, that's the power of the convention, you mm-hmm. know, is you can, you can share stories with other people that have been in the industry for decades. And, um, you know, you can trade advice. And uh, so, yeah, I, you know, did, did it scare you when you first started? No, because I had the hot dog business. Like I had started with that and just overcoming the fears that come with like starting your own business for the first time. I actually have a, a story for you about that. So the first night that I went out, I, you know, I worked for months and months on this. I saved the money for my sales job and I finally got the health permits. I finally got the carts shipped in from Canada. Uh, I got everything like got the place for food storage and all that. And I went to like this dark part of the city, (laughs) like not a lot of street lights, kind of like on the edge of the stadium. And there was a a blue St. Louis blues hockey. So I was kind of on near this parking lot and I just sat there like all night. It was so fucking cold, man. I was freezing so bad. And uh, I sold like nothing, you know, and I'm like waiting for the game to finish, you know, so when the people come out, like I'm ready and it didn't go well. I sold like, you know, maybe six hot dogs or something, you know, but I was happy that I got it started. You know, I'm like, I'm like, you know what? I don't care. This is awesome. Like I got finally got it started. Like I'm going to do this thing. And I turn around and I walk back toward my truck at the end of the night. And like I had had the boxes of hot dogs. There was like a hundred hot dogs in a box. All beef kosher dogs, by the way. You would really like them. And uh, so, uh, yeah, it was so cold. I didn't even have to freeze them. I just had them in the back of my truck. Somebody stole all of them. Like three boxes, like 300 hot dogs. They fucking stole. Some guy's like, hey, Rodney, look at all these hot dogs out there. Yeah. And you know what, though? It didn't discourage me at all, man. I just kind of like laughed and I'm like, you know what? Like, I guess every beginning has to, you know, I'm like, it can't get any worse than this, you know? <laughs> oh, totally. Yeah, totally. yeah. Like, I, yeah, I, I had a few, ex- we, we had one event, I think it was like our second year out the gates. And we had like these Velcro demos, you know, really fancy operation uh, at the time. <laughs> but we had these like, we had this Velcro wall. We had these Velcro demos, you know, we had like Scarface and, you know, like Tupac and all that shit. You know, people had like, everyone would just eat up. Yeah. And the next day we show up and they're all gone. So you had them to where people could just rip the actual painting or the drawing off? So, so it was just a dem- it was just a demonstration to, so people could see our style. Yeah, yeah. See all, all the things we do. And it basically, you could just like peel them off the wall. Ah. Uh. The end of the day or whatever and so we show up to the the the, the tent the next day and someone stole all of our freaking demos oh shit man all of them there were some crappy ones man like there was like there was like taylor's don't get me wrong sorry taylor swift fans Um, (laughs) we had like taylor swift and we had you know we had like a robert downey jr one and uh, you know, we're trying to cater to like every demographic, Yeah. but yeah. someone was just like, I'm going to poke my head in this tent and see what they've got. Oh, it's just a bunch of shitty drawings. Okay. And then they took this them. will work perfect on my Velcro wall. <laughs> yeah, right? I'm like, what are you guys 
thinking, like, <laughs> I can't help but think how many other tents they, like, visited at yeah. that event where they just, like, poked their head in. They're like, ooh, what can we take from here? Yeah, yeah. So, God, man, people are crazy. Now, hot dogs. There's a practical application for that. Yeah, I kind of thought, well, maybe it was someone who was, like, poor. There was a lot of homeless people around that area, so I thought, all right, maybe they're going to have a hot dog party. That brings me... Yeah. Hey, more power to them, man. Man, I used to, like, I would steam these dogs, right? And then I would cut them. And when you just run a blade over them, they just split open like that. And then I would take easy cheese and I would squeeze the easy cheese in there. And then I had a little, I don't know if you know these, like, butane, like, little torches. Oh, yeah. So I would, like, torch it. It was, like, uh, I, would, I would do also with cream cheese and I would, like, torch the cheese on the top so it was, like, crusty on the top. And then I'd put, like celery salt on there and sport peppers and i even had my own yeah. sauce it was like mississippi mud i called it mississippi mud sauce that's uh you know that's <laughs> usually what happens when you have too much barbecue <laughs> yeah 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 that mississippi mud vibe man i'm getting hungry just thinking about it yeah thanks a lot for that sam yeah. i uh you, you need know, to take a I break i had to skip lunch so i wasn't wouldn't be bloated during the interview and now i can think about our our uh, koshers not as bloated right <laughs> uh, yeah, not as blooded. No, no more than usual. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, let's see. Oh, yeah. I want to talk to you about uh, how you're dealing with this Corona, the Sharona. Oh yeah. How's it going? Yeah, it's good. It's good. So we, so our business is structured in a way where all of our artists, or most of our artists, are employees. And we would pay our, you know, our, our payroll taxes and all that. And so for a lot of them, it was actually pretty easy for them to get on unemployment. So, you know, our artists are pretty comfortable right now. Nice. For the most part. Um, you know, we had a few that didn't, like, meet the hour requirement. But then they were able to get, to, like, the, the COVID relief mm-hmm. unemployment, which is, which is good. So that was kind of, like, one of the more stressful aspects at the beginning was – okay, so we, we don't have a business right now. Uh, you know, your, your biggest concern as a business owner is like, I just want to make sure the people that work for me are taken care of. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That they're, that they're going to be okay. Especially out here because rent's expensive and, you know, all these other expenses are just, it, it's an exorbitant amount of money. So In Seattle? they're all good. Um, I'm, I'm pretty, I'm pretty fortunate. I actually like, I bought a house I bought the house I'm currently in like a week before all the shit went down. Oh, man. So I was like, okay, well, I got no one to help me move now, but I'm, I'm also not working. And yeah. there's also no traffic. So yeah. <laughs> maybe this isn't a bad thing. So I just kind of spent the first three weeks moving into my house and moving, you know, getting the family moved in and then selling my old house. So that's been keeping me busy. I've been doing lots of commissions. Um, I've been I've just been trying to like stay positive and, and just keep working. And um, I've been really fortunate. A lot of the people I've been working with from a, from a freelance standpoint, there were already projects that were in the mix before Corona happened that mm-hmm. are starting to kind of be phased out. Okay. Where, I can I can start making a decent amount of money off of those projects because okay. a lot of what I do are it's based off of the sales. Okay. So I'll get I'll get money off the top of whatever they sell. So that's been cool. And so like, what's that? Is that for the WWE or Marvel and Tops and all those guys or? So the the Marvel and Top stuff that's all work for hire. Oh. Okay. Or or I license out the art. So the Marvel was just one project. They just wanted me to do something for their Evergreen line, which is for the kids. And they just wanted to kind of like me to put my spin on the Guardians of the Galaxy. Mm-hmm. So that was kind of cool because it gave me a lot of direction. And um, it definitely helped me grow just because I had a lot of feedback and a lot of notes because you're dealing with these properties that, you know, millions of people love. Mm-hmm. Um, that was a cool project. The top stuff is basically they license artwork that I've already created. Okay. So they'll say, hey, we want the drawing you did of this person, this person, this person, this person. And how much would the license be for six months? And then so I just give them the license to put it on their digital app. Because I guess even trading cards are digital now. Oh, that's weird. Which is wild. It's, it's nuts. Like, I, I was like, they, you can get 
you remember back in the day you would get like your your baseball cards and like you'd get like the limited edition like gold hollow foil yeah yeah like cal ripken jr yeah well with some bubble gum in the cards, back yeah they, yeah they get they have they have those they still have them but they're digital now huh and it's like one in like ten thousand, and they're like well i got the limited edition you know blah 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 this is nuts this, <laughs> when it when when it's all said and done, I still got boxes of fucking cards behind me. When it's all said and done for you, brother, what do you have? Like, it's not. There's nothing there. Yeah, yeah. But I guess there's value in that for for this generation. You know, it's it's all about the hunt. But huh. but then um, I'm doing these jackets with a company called Chalkline. Mm-hmm. Uh, you remember like those throwback jackets where you'd have like Michael Jordan on the back. Mm-hmm, yeah. So screened on satin and it would have like bulls. Yeah, yeah. So that's the company. Oh, they're cool. still around, but now they're doing, um, uh, I forget what it's called, like instant ink transfer or something like that, mm-hmm. where they can actually, all you do is order it and then they make it and then ship it to you. Mm, it's like drop shipping almost, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So that's, WWE is one of the licenses. They also work with Nickelodeon. Um, they do like Ninja Turtles. They do a bunch of stuff. But that's been that's been my big one recently. I want to ask uh, you about that. You did they find you or did you find them? It's an interesting story because initially they did find me, um, but we couldn't like we couldn't really meet in the middle about like what kind of project to work on mm-hmm. and like what the compensation would be. And then they would continue to kind of follow my stuff and keep an eye on me. And I would occasionally just drop them a line, say, hey, check out this cool piece. That looked pretty cool in a jacket. And then eventually they hit me up and they said, you know what, let's just, let's just do this. Like, let's do a six jacket run. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll have you on contract from now until next year. And uh, we really like these three pieces you've done. Let's go ahead and like start making some jackets for those. And then they would hit me up like, hey, WWE wants to do like a custom thing for this superstar. Hmm. Can you work on it? And then uh, out of good faith and knowing like what the, what the, what the machine is capable of, mm-hmm. I do the work completely pro bono. And then whatever they sell, I get a percentage of that. Hmm. And so it, the last one I did was like a, a Triple H 25th anniversary and it, it paid off very well. Nice. So... You kind of have to be choosy about the subject matter. You kind of have to say, I'm really excited to do this person because in your head, you know, it's going to sell really well. Mm -hmm. You're like, you know, this, I think, I think this person is really the best fit for the jacket Mm -hmm. because you know, you're going to get a much better compensation for it. So the reason I bring that up is because you were already into professional wrestling before, right? I mean, that's something that you you dig. Yeah. So that's kind of a a point just like to all artists and illustrators and people listening, because, you know, it's like when you, there are some people that will cater their work to get more followers or like, because like drawing pretty girls will get you more Instagram followers or whatever. Um, but what I found, um, only judging by Instagram, not, I mean, I'm, look at me, I'm externalizing my own feelings and emotions to like Instagram, but I know that like whenever I feel inspired by something, um, and I do put it out there, I get the feedback immediately. Um, I just did a piece, um, a couple weeks ago or about a month ago, actually of, uh, Tom York. And it was from the from the video uh, "No Surprises," the yeah, one where the about that. yeah yeah, and I put that one up, and I was like so inspired by that piece. I just did that painting that night, and I put it up, and that was like immediately like it hit, you know. So yeah, I could do like Marvel comics and all of that, and you know they're cool or whatever, but I'm not like passionate about that. That's not what my passion is. Right. So you're a good example of that. Like you're really into that. You put the time and the effort into it, and then like they found you, and then you got a deal like that. So like chances are like whatever you're into, like whatever you're passionate about, there's probably other people out there, or maybe even a whole industry that's like into that. You know. Oh, totally. Yeah. yeah, like there's there's a whole community of like wrestling artists that I've discovered through Instagram and Twitter. Very talented people. And it's almost this really cool thing. You kind of get to share 
and the successes you have because when you see, you know, person A and person B get a product, you know, made or get recognition from a wrestler or whatever, uh, it, it, it brings you great joy. Um, but that is really sound advice uh, to any artist that's trying to kind of make their way in the professional world is try to follow your passions, try to follow the things that you are invested in emotionally. Mm -hmm. Uh, for me, I came up on comic books. I've got a, I'm pretty much hiding my entire comic book collection behind me. Pull it back. Let's have a look. Like all these boxes down here, boxes up there. Yeah. It's all stuff like, you know, that I collected when I was younger, but those are also the, the styles that influenced me. Mm -hmm. Wrestling, I've been a wrestling fan since 1990. Um, I've always been invested in that. It's it's live theater. It's, you know, there's no illusions. Everyone knows it's fake. But every movie, every form of entertainment you watch besides music, it's fake. It's scripted. It's written. You're, mm -hmm. but, but I get to watch my performances live. Yeah. So I get to I get to be invested in that aspect of it, and it's also it's like watching a real life comic book. You know, colorful characters. Yeah. Each with their defined strengths, their defined weaknesses, amazing costumes, imagery. It's all stuff that I love. Oh and man, I wanted to tell you that I loved that piece that you did from the movie They Live. Oh yeah. I'm man. so glad you did that one, man. I gotta get a print of that one. That was so. Yeah, awesome. yeah, yeah totally. Yeah. Oh man, it was so much fun working on the Halloween stuff. Cause I, are you a big horror fan? Yeah. So what's what are like what are your top three horror movies? Evil Dead is probably up there. Um, I don't know if it's a horror movie, but Beetlejuice is definitely up there. And I don't know. I haven't thought about that in a while. It's been a while since I've watched a horror movie. What about you? I mean Romero's original Night of the Living Dead. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's one that like really kind of got stuck in my brain. That was something that I, to this day I, I still always fall back to that one. Um, one I recently watched. I can't really say it's a horror movie, but I really enjoyed it. Is um, it follows? It follows. It's called It Follows. Never heard that. So it's got a really awesome, uh, like atmospheric synth. Uh, soundtrack. Mm. It's very reminiscent of movies shot in the 80s, but it's about the way it works is, and there's, there's no spoilers here, but if you have sex with someone that's afflicted with this, I'm going to just say supernatural STD. <laughs> uh, if you have sex with them, it leaves them and it transfers to you. And what happens is this supernatural STD doesn't affect you physically, but now you have thing this 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 being follows you oh everywhere you go like herpes and the being takes different forms <laughs> yeah and as it's it to know you it takes the form of people you know Ooh. and so it just continues to follow you so you have to constantly be moving it's always moving at the same rate it's always just walking mm. but it is so freaky Cause you'll look, you'll, you'll have this camera shot of just like this girl just doing her normal thing. And then out of nowhere, you just see like this thing in the background, this person just like walking slowly and they could be like blocks away and you're just like, Oh, oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Oh shit. Yeah. But yeah. Once it catches you, you're dead. So you have that's, to dance for it. That's movie magic, man. Like that they can, yeah. that they can create those kind of that, that kind of tension and those kind of emotions. Oh, it's amazing. I highly recommend it, man. I would also put They Live, but that's kind of like more of a sci-fi. Oh, have you ever seen Repo Man? Repo Man? Yeah. Is that the, is that the one that Spielberg, or not, uh, uh, Stephen King directed while all coked up? It has Emilio Estevez in it. It's yes. an old, old one. Oh, I have to see that one, man. I heard about it. It's like a weird sci-fi. It's not really a horror, but it's like a weird sci-fi one. But I don't know. It's just great, man. Like in St. Louis, we had this movie theater, the Tivoli, and they would do midnight movies, and they would always do like real cheesy old 80s movies like that. And the special effects are fucking priceless, man. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. Best. Yeah. I just watched Ghostbusters, too, the original Ghostbusters. 
It's, it's still great, man. Oh, it's good, man. Oh, the scenes are great. I love the noise in the film. Oh, it's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's like, uh, did you watch the movies that made us on Netflix? Oh, I watched part of that. I haven't, I haven't gotten back into that, but yeah. They did a Ghostbusters episode, and oh. apparently Bill Murray, they didn't know if he was going to show up on set. He said he was going to do it, but they didn't really have much communication with them. You couldn't exactly email people in 84. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so he uh, he just showed up like the first day of shooting. Mer- uh, no, it was, um, uh, it was it was Harold Ramis and Aykroyd. Yeah, I think Murray, I think Murray just uh, I think Murray ad libbed a lot. I mean, yeah, he practically wrote it. But I but think what I was saying was I think that Aykroyd wrote the second one. Oh, got it. Okay. You can see the leap in cinematography in those five years, man. Like the first yeah. one compared to the second one, it's like major difference. Was it a different director? Uh, no, it was Ivan Reitman for both. That's a question that I have for you too. Is like I'm wondering if I were to do like a series of '80s movies because I've been doing like some painting sketches of those, but mm-hmm. I wouldn't be able to license that, wouldn't because that's not my property, right? The way so the way fan art works, and I can share all kinds of different experiences I've had. But uh, it's all still copyrighted. So if you were to find something more obscure, for example, Mm -hmm. and like let's say you did artwork for They Live, or even Repo Man, that's still pretty. Or even fuck Repo Man, like no one's gonna give a shit. You know, I mean, I mean, people are gonna there's gonna be like that subculture that really is into it and wants to like latch onto it. But like I don't think anyone's gonna come after you for something like that. Um, I've you know despite the fact that I've done work for WWE. I they sent me a cease and desist for the prints I was selling through my store mm. because it's copyrighted characters, copyrighted imagery. Mm-hmm. And so even though I do work for them on a licensing aspect, uh, they still need to get their cut. Mm-hmm. I had to take that stuff down. Uh, same goes, I did a series of Batman and Jokers. Mm-hmm. Warner Brothers, within like a week, like shut it down. Wow. They emailed me like within a week. And they're like, you have to remove these immediately. And you're doing that through Big Cartel? Yeah, I was doing it through Big Cartel. But, you know, the way you siphon people to your store is, you know, obviously there's Instagram marketing, but uh, hashtagging, geotagging with uh, Big Cartel, I would tag each individual piece. Mm -hmm. Uh, And whatever algorithm they have, Warner Brothers or their legal team has, they... You know, they just have, like, people, just, like, monkeys behind a keyboard, just, like, searching for shit. Yeah, you yeah. Know? Just so they can, like, peg you, even though you're only making, like, a few hundred bucks off these prints. Like, what's, a f- what's, what's like, 20% of a few hundred bucks to Warner Brothers? It's yeah. nothing, you know? Yeah. It's like, they pay their catering staff more than that. <laughs> so it's, it's just, like, you know, it's interesting how that world operates, but I think things that are more fringe, like 80s movies... Um, you know, stuff like that. I, I don't think you'd get as much blowback hmm. trying to like sell prints for stuff like that. Have you ever gotten to meet one of your uh, favorite wrestlers or? Yeah, man. I, that's cool. Actually, what got me into the world of wrestling was Hulk Hogan. Yeah. Right, right back in the day. And I, this is actually funny. This is how caricatures kind of segued me into other avenues. I, did a caricature of Hulk Hogan, I want to say back in like 2008, mm-hmm. 2009. And I get a phone call in 2012, and it's a guy named Ron Howard, no relation to the director. Okay. Uh, just some dude out of Florida. And he's like, hey, man, you know, I'm friends with the Hulkster. And he <laughs> saw, he saw your, your drawing on Google, and he wants to work with you. He wants like you to do some shirts and, and some more stuff. And I'm like... All right, you know what? I'm not gonna believe you until I actually hear from the man himself. Yeah, yeah. So, I remember like it was yesterday. I had my speakerphone on. I brought Dexter into the room because at the time we lived with each other, and I put the speakerphone down, and it's Hulk Hogan's voice. Oh shit! And you can't replicate that. You can't like. I mean, you probably could. He's like, "This is no one, Harris." Hey, dude. You know, but anyways, uh, he starts like pitching ideas like. Let me tell you something, brother. Here's what I have in mind. 
I want to be. <laughs> so he's really, really talking like that. <laughs> well, I want to be ripping my chest apart, and I want you to see machine parts like the Terminator, and I want to have like an extra big heart because I'm all, I'm all heart, brother. <laughs> And then there was like one where he was like, his foot was on top of Osama bin Laden's head. And, like, and he's like flexing and it says Hogan for president. Just like these wild ideas. So he's yeah. really like that. That's really who he is. Oh, dude. Yeah. All, all the way. I mean, he's, he's one of the kindest people I've ever worked for, you know, and, and the public has their opinion. That's fine. Whatever. But um, I was out in Florida on vacation with my wife. And we were, you know, I, I, I gave Ron Howard a heads up. I'm like, hey, man, we're going to come out to Florida. Can you get us tickets to the wrestling show that Hogan's in? Um, so that wasn't a problem. But I was also like, you know, we'd love to meet the big man, uh, swing by his beach shop and meet him. And at the time, I had done the logo for the beach shop. Like, they have this, like, big giant sign. It's, like, uh, it's raised. It's him, like, doing this. Um, I did, like, a handful of shirts. and uh, And so Hogan, you know, was like, yeah, yeah, tell them I'll be there. Well, the day we show up to the shop, uh, Ron's like, hey, guys, listen, Hogan's meeting with his lawyers right now. Uh, this video just came out. And I was like, video? He's like, uh, it's a sex tape. <laughs> and I'm like, are you serious? And so he's like, yeah, I don't think, I don't think he's going to make it. You know, this is kind of a big thing. This is like a very stressful thing because it's not with his wife. It's with someone else. And um, I'm like, okay, well, my wife and I are just going to hang out on the beach for a bit. We're going to grab some food. Uh, just keep me posted. Let me know if he's if he's done. He was at the wing stop with his lawyers. <laughs> um, so anyways, I get the call, and they're like, hey, he still wants to meet you. And I'm like, oh, fuck yeah. So my wife and I get to the beach shop, and here he comes. You know, six, six, six foot five, massive man. Still massive. Is he still shredded? Huge. I don't know if it's the same now. It's been like eight years, but still huge. Uh, obviously, he he had a he had a rough morning, but um, just the fact that he took the time, like you know, we hung out for like twenty minutes, and you know, I would tell him stories about you know when I was a kid, and I'd see him wrestle live, and and it was uh, it was awesome, man. It was like uh, an experience I'll never forget. Yeah, yeah, that's cool. Yeah, and to this day, if people shit talk him, I'm just like, listen, you know, I can only base people off of my personal experiences with them, and and he he was good to me, and he's he's still good to me. Like I still do work for him occasionally. Um, he got my profile out there, he got my work out there, and um, and then since then, most of my interactions with wrestlers have just been like per like online. Mm -hmm. But you know, I can still I still get you know ringside seats to wrestling shows. That's awesome. I, relationships with these people and you know i i still can't get backstage <laughs> but but that's yeah. fine you know maybe one day you will well we'll see if i play my cards right huh so actually that's one of the next things i wanted to ask you about before we go into like looking at artwork um is just about instagram and how you go about that because um I don't know. It's weird because I talked to T. Ding and he said that he doesn't really get much business from his Instagram anyway. And he's got almost 200,000 followers. Um, right. That but, really surprised me yeah. when, I, when, I, when I saw that. I was like, oh, my God, this guy's like amazing. Yeah. And he's I think he's just not utilizing it properly. But um, it's not everything. You know, Instagram isn't everything. It is like a way to, to funnel to funnel people to your business. But um, how do you go about that or what is your strategy with that? And when did you see like your leap? Cause right now you're like, what are you at? 15,000 or no, I'm like at 40, 42, 42,000. Okay. So did you see like, like a big leap or like what happened there? So I think I've been using it for about nine years now. Um, originally I just used it like as a photo platform, you know, I just go about my, my daily business and whatever. Mm -hmm. But then I started posting like old artwork like stuff I had done and I started to get like a little more traction. People were more into it. Um, I didn't really have my first breakthrough until about maybe five years ago, somewhere around there, mm -hmm. uh, where I did like a piece of a wrestler. I don't even remember who it was, but they shared it. And like, I ended up getting like a thousand or 2000 followers overnight. Wow. And it blew my mind. And it, you know, it's all organic. Like it was all just kind of like plugging away 
trying to find ways where I could do what I love, but kind of funnel that into uh, a, a marketing scheme. Mm-hmm. You know, like I, I draw subject matters that I that I truly appreciate, and if they appreciate it, most times they'll share it, and then that'll bump my profile up nice. that much more. Yeah. But it was all organic, man. Like, it all just kind of came from drawing. You know, once I really kind of, like, got serious. Oh, my live video ended. Well, (laughs) there we go. Uh, Anyways, once I got really serious about it, uh, I really started to see things kind of start to work for me. Mm -hmm. You know, like, I've been able to monetize it in a way where I can probably, I probably make... 15 to 20 percent of my income through Instagram really wow yeah and it's but it, it sounds it was like you and uh, CD need to have a conversation and, and that's why I was surprised because I was like man if I had that many followers I'd be really you know cooking but I'm really I'm really only just now starting to uh, uh, you know enjoy the fruits of my labor mm-hmm. like I think last year I was off to a really good start with the prints. Um, but that required a lot of work. You know, I would still have to like put in my print order. I'd have to mail each one out. Oh, my margin. It was mainly my margins. My margins were okay. But it was mainly, I was just doing it because people appreciated having my art. Mm-hmm. So it's kind of like, okay, well I'm making this much off the dollar, but I'm, I'm giving something to somebody that that's truly going to love it. You know what I mean? Yeah. So that, that felt good. So what is, what, like when you were shipping them out, was that, were you just getting them, like printing them yourself and then shipping them? And then like the next question is, is like, did you make that move to big cartel or, because I'm asking this question specifically because I started a uh, Shopify account and Mm -hmm. I spent a bunch of time building it. And then I realized like, man, I don't want to manage this shop, you know? Right. So maybe I'll go ahead and pay Big Cartel that other percentage and just let them manage all of that. They don't do that. Big Big Cartel is just a hosting platform. Mm-hmm. Like they'll they'll take payment, you know, and then they'll take out the taxes and all that stuff. But you still have to do the legwork. Now you might be thinking of like Redbubble, mm. right? Uh, sites like Redbubble, Society Six. Those guys, mm-hmm. you just upload your art. They do all the legwork, but you get like twenty percent. You don't. You barely get that. You know, oh. you, get, you get like probably like fifteen, ten percent, depending on what the item is. But you're not doing a damn thing. Yeah, you know, just putting it up there. But I guess my my thing is like, I was thinking that if I got on Big Cartel, that it's already a place where people are looking for prints, and yeah. And maybe I have to do some of the work, but if you have your own Shopify store, you have to do everything. So I would imagine like Big Cartel probably does some of that marketing, right? Or at least just by virtue of them being Big Cartel, though, you know, people are seeing your stuff. I think there's name value. Mm -hmm. Um, A lot of the traction I ended up getting was through promotion. Like I I would promote if I had like a new set of prints up or if I'd get a DM Someone's like, hey, do you have a print of this? I, I direct them there. Mm-hmm. Um, I also sold commissions through the through the big cartel, uh, which I still do. What do you mean uh, you draw a commission and then someone gets it off a t-shirt or something? No, no, no. So big cartel doesn't do any of that. They're they're just a platform. Like I still have to make the prints myself oh. and ship them. Oh, okay. Yeah, big cartel is just a platform for you to post your product. Okay, okay. You still have to do the work, but the the flip end of that is you profit more from that. Yeah. So if you're paying Big Cartel ten bucks a month to let you put up twenty items, uh, you're only paying out ten bucks a month for that opportunity. Mm. Um, when I would sell a print, for example, you know most of my print orders were bulk orders. So if I would sell one print for twelve bucks, you know they pay for the shipping, I do the leg work and ship it out. The margin's okay, but if I sell four prints, put it in the same tube, they're only paying a dollar more for shipping, and my margin just went. Yeah. So, it worked out pretty well last year from a print standpoint. There was some legwork involved, but if you just work it into your schedule, if you just say this is the day 
I'm going to make and, and ship out prints, mm -hmm. it, it only takes like two hours out of your day. Mm -hmm. So that was a really good way of utilizing my IG presence was selling prints on Big Cartel. Now that I have, you know, essentially been shut down by the bigger conglomerates, I'm just doing, you know, commissions through there. But most of the commissions I do are just organically through Instagram. Hmm. Well, let's but, let's switch over to uh, a little discussion about line work, yeah? Like, yeah, let's do it. Why don't we talk a little bit about like a few things or let's say like, I don't know, four things, four ways to better line work. Um, uh, and then I'll just put your picture next to the comment why your line work sucks and then we're, we're golden. <laughs> I think uh, I want to say one thing to start it off is that I've noticed uh, a couple of things that people do just sort of like physically. Like um, I have this paper-like plastic sheet over my iPad um, and I've noticed that you and a lot of other people have like an um, extra thing that you add to the Apple Pencil. Yeah, this little, this little guy right here. Yeah, I gotta get one of those because my my fingers are starting to hurt when I draw for a really long. Yeah, it, it definitely helps. So yeah, I mean, just there, that's actually one thing right there. I mean, we can even list that as like a way to make it more comfortable and uh, make your lines like make it a little easier for you to smooth it out. But what about uh, what about you? I mean, what is your practice? It's not just the brushes or the pens that you're using. It's like there's other technique behind it, yeah. What I used to do, so this is why I feel like people in the digital realm might benefit from having like the fair theme park experience because a lot of the training that goes into being a theme park or fair artist involves the utilization of your marker nib and how you can really create good dagger strokes, clean strokes, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, I definitely feel like starting drawing characters upright helped me in the long run, even though I'm not drawing on my iPad upright, you know, it, it definitely helped me understand how to utilize my shoulder and my wrist mm -hmm. to get like nicer, smoother lines. Mm -hmm. But when I first started doing uh, digital caricatures, I did a series of tutorial videos back in the day and I had that rubber, you know, the rubber stylus that they had. No. Had, like, so like when the, when the iPad. Oh first came out, yeah. 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 Okay. Yeah. Yeah, iPad one, <laughs> the first one. Um, I don't even know what the fuck they're on now, but uh, we had a rubber capacitive tip, and I had to cheat like nobody's business to get the line quality I wanted. And even then, it still wasn't great. Mm -hmm. But I would I would draw the line, and I get my eraser tool, and then I would like carve away mm -hmm. at the line to get like the desired like width yeah. that I wanted. Yeah. It, it added like an hour onto each commission. Oh, man. Yeah. But it looked it looked it looked, you know, like a a, de a decent drawing. I mean, they they still weren't great due to the limitations of the software, but they were still pretty good. Mm -hmm. Um so once the and you know, I worked on Wacom for years and that that definitely helped. Um but once the iPad Pro came, came onto the picture, uh, that definitely took a lot of finessing at first because I, I really don't think they were quite there right away when the iPad Pro came out. Mm -hmm. Like I don't feel like the the pen the pencil was really at its fullest of its capabilities. Um, so even then I had to do some cheats, like chipping away, you know, what did I, I, I called it in a video of molding my line mm -hmm. or like chiseling my line. But now with Procreate and with the variety of different vector apps, you can get some pretty good lines with, with minimal effort. But yeah, this guy definitely helps quite a bit. Mm -hmm. um, I actually, I, I used to, I used to be endorsed by paper. Like I used to do, um, I used to do like promotion for them. So you use the plastic or paper, like the, the cover. Okay. Yeah, I used to. I used to use it for uh, for live gigs and for illustrations and everything. But then after a while, I, I, I did get used to the glass, and now I just go straight onto the glass. Okay. Yeah, because apparently that uh, preserves the nib, right? It preserves the nib, and I didn't like how scratched up those um, covers would get after a while. Yeah. It just didn't look great. 
Yeah. So um, that's not to say it's not a good product. I do think it's a, a fantastic product, but um, it's also it's not for everybody. Yeah. So I guess I was afraid that I draw on it so much that it's just gonna like really screw that screen up. So for me, kind of like it's almost like a shield or some kind of protection. But have you found that, or do you like how old is your iPad? This one is about a year and a half, mm -hmm. and there's not a scratch on it. And it's just still no sign of damage at all on that screen, huh? No, there's none. You have the so, big one, right? The 12.9? Yeah, it's got a lot of like spit marks all over it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. But, uh, yeah, but no, it's it's fine. There's no, no scratches, nothing. Um, I probably go through like one nib every, I don't know, three months maybe. Yeah. And then, and that, but I'm drawing, I'm, I mean, I'm drawing this thing every day. Yeah. You know, and it's, it's still holding up okay. So, yeah. Are you making your own brushes? No, I'm not. Um, but Procreate just came out with, like, their recent update, and they just loaded it with all kinds of new brushes. They're fantastic. Like, um, and then I got the, have you ever heard of the Debaser pack? No. There's, I forget the name of the company. I know I know Kiko just discovered them based off of the <coughs> drawing submitted. Um, but they they make these like specialty nibs that look like uh, this might actually be pretty cool with like pulp movies or like mm. cheesy eighties movies because they're they're like distressed looking. Oh, I think I've seen that. Yeah, that's like a it's like a it's got more of like a distressed kind of look to it oh yeah i've seen those yeah but what? are they in procreate or do you have to buy the packs you have to buy the packs but they they'll occasionally have like a big sale mm -hmm. and um i think i got them for like 20 percent off you know not too long ago and but you also get brush packs like half tone zip tone patterns um you get overlays to make your artwork look like it's like it's like aged hmm. stuff like that and then yeah. they, they send you palettes too Oh, oh, that's cool. Yeah, I think cool. for me it's like overwhelming, you know? It's like uh, there's so many brushes, I don't know what to pick, you know? Yeah. But I guess if I'm going to – I guess that's one of the things that is kind of like a shortcut to developing a style or a certain like uh, package of drawings or something that it kind of has a unified feel is like selecting a few brushes that go like exactly with that. Yeah. So is that, I mean, that's probably something that you, would Would you say that that's something that helps with your line work? Is like you have four or five brushes that you use for your... For yeah, your, absolutely. Yeah. I think having uh, work, uh, like a, a decent workflow established mm -hmm. is, is a powerful tool for any artist. Um, I don't really think it hinders diversity. I don't think it hinders any artist from wanting to push outside of it. But if you know you've got a project where this is the expectation because they know your style, mm -hmm. you know you can rely on those tools to get the job done and to get the job done well. Um, I think drawing live caricatures has also helped a lot in that respect. You know, drawing live digitally, you have to have like a very set uh, workflow. Like mm -hmm. you have to have layer one, two, three, four, and five. You have to have them set a certain way. You have to have your palette. The, the right brush there's little room for exploration mm -hmm. when you have the, the expectation that you're going to do this many caricatures per hour yeah so i think that also kind of spills over into like you know freelance or professional level work but uh yeah i i probably have maybe four brushes i rely on and then if i want to do something kind of outside the box i'll start to dig into my texture brushes mm-hmm and kind of see how to integrate those. Um, so yeah, like that was that was actually one thing that when when you interviewed Z that really like stood out to me is that um, he said something along the lines of it's not the brush, it's the observation. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of it just comes down to finding your comfort level with a certain set of brushes, and then just it's all observation from there. Um, I hate to poach what he said because that's just like the easiest thing to do, but... Yeah, well, it's true. Yeah, when he said it, I was like, yeah, that, of course, that makes perfect sense. So how many hours a day would you say that you're drawing like on a day that you're not working? Well, like, it's been a shit ton lately. Yeah, yeah. 
But one of those, uh, like one of your wrestlers, like how long would that take you? Uh, I'd say, I'd say, depending on the concept, uh, maybe two hours, two two and a half hours. Uh, there's some pieces where I'm more invested in the character and kind of what makes that character unique, and I'll integrate a certain color palette or I'll integrate, you know, certain elements that lend themselves to that person, that character. Yeah. That, that might take a little bit longer. Mm-hmm. Um, when I first started doing them, it was just like a fun little experiment to just like kind of like draw my heroes and make them look cool. Mm-hmm. And then I think maybe last year I decided to kind of get a little more conceptual with it and and start integrating more fantastical elements. To yeah, make that's, it. that's definitely bumped it up. Yeah, like I, and it feels good, you know, like as an artist, you know, we're always trying, you know, I think growth comes in many ways, you know, for, for some, their growth is how, how to exaggerate something in a completely different fashion or how to stylize something or color palettes or speed or whatever. And I think right now for me, it's, it's kind of like the realization of, of a, of a vision, like almost thinking cinematically. Yeah, I like the one, I don't know what the wrestler was, or who the wrestler was, but he's like flexing like this, and the arms are like a galaxy. It's like the galaxy inside the arms. Oh, yeah. Where, that one's pretty I rad. I like that idea. You know, yeah, I've been working on this style. You've probably seen it here or there, but it's like a, it's like a polygram. I call it like a polygram style. And it's basically made up of, speaking of line work, it's like made up of these straight lines or these curved lines. You know, they have that tool in Procreate now. Yeah. And I had this weird experience with it where it's like, I always love doing the sketch, which is always, no matter what kind of piece I'm doing. And then that one, like, I just really hate the process of doing like all the lines and cleaning it all up and then dropping the colors in. And then at the very end, sometimes I'll add like a collage element and uh, that will, and like at the very end when it comes together, I love it. But like that middle part, I hate it. I don't know what that is. And it, it's like, goes, man. yeah, you just gotta, you just gotta, you, once you get over that hump, I think everyone, everyone has that hump, you know? Yeah. I mean, shit, every time you draw a caricature, there's always going to be like that one thing you, you, you're not super happy about, Yeah. but you, you get over it pretty quickly. Yeah. But I, I really am like wanting to keep going with that style because I've been able to develop it a little bit further. And, um, it's, it's kind of similar to some styles that I've seen, but it's not, you know, there's nothing like exactly like that out there. So yeah, I think I'm going to keep exploring that and going forward with that because it's the first time I've actually been able to focus on something for long enough to where it like kind of looks like a body of work or kind of looks like a style, you know? Yeah. Yeah. What um what influenced you to kind of go down that that direction, that path? Was there a specific artist or something you saw? Yeah, yeah. What I was just thinking about it one day and I remember this guy I used to go to art school with and anytime we did figure drawing, he had a ruler and he would just do the whole figure with like straight lines. And he would okay. come up with these like really awesome figure drawings. And they kind of looked like, I don't know if you know the um, the art piece, The Nude Descending a Staircase. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of had that look about it. So I thought, oh, well, if I do caricatures like that, that might be cool. And it kind of turned into something else, but like it still has that like kind of cubey, cubey, like plain look. And... Um, yeah, I started trying to apply C. Ding's lighting style to it, and I got some pretty cool results with that. Um, but yeah, I think I'm going to keep pushing that. I think that's not a bad idea, and I think uh, you know being able being able to integrate that maybe into like a movie poster style, or because that's how I kind of got over when you draw caricatures. That's one thing, you know, you're you're seeking exaggeration, you're seeking truth. But then once you push caricature into a conceptual element, that's when I think you're really like exploring the true power of caricature. Hmm. Like kind of going back to political artists and, and their utilization of caricature into an overall like message or whatever. I think that one thing that I would try to do is I, I, I would do caricatures of movie posters mm-hmm. like way back in the day. 
Yeah. And I, I would be like, I want to explore this Casablanca poster, but I want to make, you know, Humphrey Bogart into a caricature. Yeah. And kind of see where that takes it. And I think maybe the integration of a style like that into something that you're also passionate about would be a really cool way to like, you know, merge things and hmm. take the, it somewhere new. There's a uh, one problem or a couple of issues that I had have, have with it. I don't mind going through that middle part that I don't like so much to get to the result that I want. But um, one thing about artwork and especially like a painterly style that I like is I like that there's some mystery or some um, implied shapes, kind of like Frank Frazetta, like, you know, there's like big black areas and you don't really know exactly what's going on back there. With this it's particular- the bog, dude. Say what? It's the bog. The bog. It's just the bog, man. The void. The void. The, the void. Ether. But uh, with this particular style, it's like so, in, um, so explicit. It's like, here it is, there you go. Okay, that's it. You know, so I have yeah. to figure out a way to like make it. I think I achieved that a little bit with the Rod Rodney Dangerfield piece that I did, but that that kind of thing is like much easier to do like with uh, painting. You know, because you can just do, like kill the edge on the ed end of the painting, and it like you're like, what's that? What's going on back there? You know. Right. So yeah, I don't know. That's just another challenge. I think that's that, that was kind of when when I was listening to your interview with Z. It, it sounded like you know he he started off doing these crazy paintings. You know, like he he was still utilizing the aspects of light. And hearing hearing him talk about light and color, it, it still blows my mind. Dude, he's like yeah. it's mathematical. <laughs> yeah. And like I remember I was at Euro Couture 2015, mm -hmm. and he gave a seminar, and like I'm like watching him dissect the math behind like color temperature and you know how it is. It's like when you're a certain like personality type, there's some things that just like go in one ear and out the other. <laughs> yeah. And I, I was just like, I just look at shit and try to make a, you know, I just try to make what I'm looking at cool. Yeah. And, and you're doing this like crazy, like super realized like math and it's crazy how he did the paradigm shift into like the more cartoony style. Yeah. It definitely worked out for him, but he's sounds like he's going through the same thing. Like he's got this, this style that he's, you know, he's, he's doing well with, but he's trying to find a way to kind of like dirty it up. And how do you find that, that happy medium? Yeah. Yeah. So it's, what it, do you do? it's hard to, it's hard to find that medium. I don't know if he's going to be able to do it because his mind is so like, it's so compartmentalized and like scientific that it's, I don't know if he's going to be able to like merge those two. It was funny. I don't know if you remember in the interview, like we both held up our copy of color and light by James Gurney. Mm -hmm. And he was like, yeah, I have that one too. And I'm like, Oh yeah. And then he's like, yeah, but uh, he's misses a lot of stuff. Like I'm going to have to write my own book. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, dude, that's fucking James Gurney. Like that's the guy who made like Dinotopia, you know, it's like, he's the master of light, you know? Yeah. But Z's, Z's book is going to be in the math section. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like, yeah. Yeah, I, I was, have a hard time quantifying, you know, it's it's like I, 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 I get so much pleasure out of seeing his art, you know, I, I get so much pleasure seeing him push himself and especially his caricature work because it's just it's it's just extraordinary. Yeah. Uh, and it's just God man, if I could crawl inside that dude's brain, it it'd probably look like the Matrix. Yeah, yeah. It's so it's scientific, good. man. And like I it's it's hard for like I, I was at his lecture too at Euro Couture. I think it was like maybe 2018 just recently. And it was like, I couldn't, my brain was just, I don't know if I was tired. It was a combination of the way he was explaining it, but it was just like, I couldn't get it. But you know what though, man, like he puts those things on Instagram where he breaks down the lighting layers. And whenever I apply that to my work, it's actually like he explains it really well in that way, like visually, and it works really well. Like it's amazing to like see your work, like like you can turn, flip the light switch on and it like lights up your character like that. It's so cool. Yeah, it's really cool he does it. When I first saw the work, I thought it was 3D, you know? I thought he was using like ZBrush or something, but yeah, he's, he's amazing. 
Well, let's get to uh, questions and artwork. Yeah. Uh, I know I might have some questions that came in through my live feed. I don't think uh, I got any questions. Um, I did get those two pieces of artwork. I think I sent them to you. Yeah. So I'm going to... Yeah. I did get a question from because I put I did a separate post just trying to get some engagement going. And boop, 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 where as, is it? As far as the artwork goes, would you mind uh, holding that up to the camera on the iPad? Yeah, sure. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, we can start with that if you want. All right, hang tight. Let me pull it up. All right. So the first piece we have is from Kiko Yamada, aka Ninja Sketch. Yeah, and I'm going to, when I edit the video, I'll put a, a more, a better quality image of that because there's a lot of nice, like, gradients in there and a lot of... Amazing. Like, um, I've had the pleasure of working with Kiko. She did a stint with us at the State Fair, and uh, this this girl is just like a sponge. Like, she's a human sponge. Like, yeah. she has this un uncanny ability to just kind of, like, see something, dissect it, she, she'll ask you questions and then boom, the next day she's doing it better than you. Yeah, yeah. It's like, you're just like, oh shit. That's that ninja, <laughs> man. That ninja sketch. These are great, man. Like, so Kiko, my, my theme was pandemic um, zombies or zombie pandemic. And Kiko did some pinup style, really retro, really retroed out pinups. Pretty cool. Yeah, they're so cool. And I can tell she got the debaser brush set because she's using uh, textured overlays. She's got, um, she's definitely got uh, a pixelation brush, and it looks like she's utilizing the palette too. I absolutely love these. Honestly, she should make stickers out of them. Yeah, yeah. Because I would buy the shit out of them. Like they're awesome. Um, some of the things I like the most about them is that the silhouettes are strong. Mm -hmm. which is a very powerful thing when it comes to illustration is having a strong silhouette, being able to read it. Um, what I love is that there's these parts of their bodies that are decayed, but they kind of look like tattoos. Yeah, yeah. And everybody loves, like, the, the classic tattoo pinup, you know? Everyone's like, super into that. But these, yeah. they look like tattoos, but they're, it's rotting flesh and bone. <laughs> um, yeah, her color palette's awesome. I love, I love, I love so much about this. Uh, Kiko did an amazing job. Yeah. That girl is going to win the Gold Nosy one day. Yeah, yeah. Quote me on that. Yeah. She won She won something at Eurocature. I think it was maybe first place for digital. I don't remember what it was exactly, but she's, yeah, she's starting to win. She's awesome, man. Like, I love her lifestyle, especially. Yeah, she, uh, was, she, she worked with us for about a month. And uh, I would I, I do like Facebook Live videos occasionally at the fair to just to kind of like show people what we're up to. And I remember I came up to her with my phone, and she looked at me, and she's like, <laughs> and she was, she was like, get that thing the fuck away from me. Yeah. And, I, and I'm like I'm like okay, and I move along, and then I come back to her, and she's like, that was a really bad sketch, Nolan. I don't want you documenting that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, ah. Oh. She's, that makes sense. Okay. She's shy, she only, though, too. You know. She only wants her best work to be seen. You know, I think that's really cool is that she has so much pride in what she does that, you know, if, if some jackass like me is behind her with the camera, she has the sense to tell them to, to get, get the fuck out of the way. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that I'm not documenting a bad drawing. Yeah, she didn't want to be interviewed either if she was too shy. So hopefully I'll talk her into it. I yeah, need to get I need to get more ladies on here, man. It's all, all guys. I've interviewed only guys so far, so. Well, that's the dilemma with this guy too, man. It's uh, it's I think the one of the top questions I always got when I was president was why aren't there more females or like why isn't there more female representation? And you know my obvious answer is well. Well, men are better at art. I mean that's like, just. No, no, no. I was just like, have you seen the guys that show up to this thing? They're probably scared shitless to, to come to the convention. Um, but it's, it was really cool. Um, what was it? Memphis, San Diego. I think I saw you at San Diego. Were, you weren't at Memphis, were you? 
No, I didn't make it. No. Yeah, yeah. Um, it was really. I, I saw a lot more women. Oh, nice. At at both conventions, which was great. And um, you know, I even I even like secretly tried to get Kiko to like to do my seminar, so I didn't have to go to Memphis because I'm not a big fan of Memphis. <laughs> but then when I got there, I was very happy. To yeah. Be part. I was actually looking up Memphis and I found this video on YouTube that was hilarious. It was like, come to Memphis. It's where Elvis once lived. And he was like, you know, they were like trying to boost up Memphis, but it was like clearly just all the shitty, boring, tired stuff about Memphis. <laughs> also where Martin Luther King Jr. got shot. So oh yeah, like that's it. another good one. Yeah. Not too much. <laughs> it was an interesting experience to say the least. It was actually, it ended up being one of my favorite conventions uh, I think the level of intimacy was a little bit greater hmm. uh, at this convention for whatever reason. I just feel like maybe like the stars were aligned, but it definitely felt. I think having um, I think having Glenn Ferguson there mm, uh, yeah. competing and like putting out amazing artwork uh, was like a real huge boost for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I know I'm getting away from what we were originally talking about, but um, yeah, there was a lot more female representation and. You know, I think having women on the board is also like a helpful motivating factor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Robin Schwartzman's on the board this year and she's oh, nice. incredible. And, you know, obviously CC is the manager. And, um, you know, when, when I stepped down, uh, the board brought Allie Tome up. And that was awesome because she was doing her podcast at the same time. Cool. Uh, or maybe she was, I forget, but she, she had a podcast too. Um, but, but yeah, it's, it's, I think it's getting there. It takes time, you know? Yeah. But I, I'm i trying to think of some female character artists in our world. We'll probably do Kelly O'Brien, actually. I think I'm going to probably do her next. Kelly would be great. She's she's fantastic to talk to. I don't want to do just caricature artists either. You know, I do want to, like, move out into illustration and maybe animation or something like that. Because for me, like, I've realized that uh, I'm going to stick to caricature as long as I can. But uh, especially with the Sharona I need yeah. I need to like branch off a little bit and like find something. So I'm working on visual development right now. So I think that's smart because I mean caricature. Obviously, we are, we all love it. We're all passionate about it. But I think a lot of the work that's coming out from a lot of people that we know in the industry has been not caricature related. Mm -hmm. I mean, Kiko did these badass pinups. You know, Kelly's been doing these awesome murals. Yeah, yeah. You know, uh, Z, you know, a lot of stuff he does is it's, it's a foundation of caricature, but it's more character design. Yeah. Yeah. But even, even the stuff I do is more kind of like illustration. Yeah. So it's like caricature is such a wonderful thing to get you branched out into other avenues of art. Yeah. And I don't know a single artist that says otherwise. Yeah. You know, because you have to learn and you have to learn fast and you have to apply all the principles in a, in a confident fashion i mean i yeah. learned more about draftsmanship from being a caricature artist than than art school so yeah. and there's nothing like like having something somebody sit in front of you like you know a motivation you know it's like if you're alone in your studio there's no consequences you know you don't have someone behind you you know yeah so you to draw draw a mustache on them or, oh or their nose isn't that big Man, I actually missed that. I actually missed that right now. Is that terrible? Yeah, it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Usually, I do it. I just do it to talk with my employees. I'll just go behind them and I'll, I'll try and do like a an accent, or my favorite is I'll try and do like a female accent and see how that works and <laughs> really try and rattle them. But it's, it, they always find out it's me. So my favorite. This is totally off topic. My favorite uh, wrestler, I think, was the Ultimate Warrior. Oh, yeah. I love yeah. the, oh, yeah. And of okay. course, the, snap into a Slim Jim, oh, yeah. <laughs> that's not, that's Macho Man. Oh, dude. oh, that's Macho Man. Okay. Well, then what, what did Ultimate Warrior say? Oh, yeah, that's right. Macho Man. <laughs> Ultimate Warrior just spoke like crazy gibberish, but he was like super veiny and mass and like vascular. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. He had like the, the, the face paint. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Hey, did you have a crazy cowboy hat and the, the fringe and all that shit? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Do you have you seen the uh, John Oliver special on professional wrestling? 
Yeah, I did. I did the the contractor versus employee. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Aspect of it. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know how they get away with it. I obviously Vince McMahon has an amazing team of lawyers behind him. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, I know we had that struggle out here in Seattle because you know we we had people that we told you know okay you got to show up here you're scheduled to be here you have to hold people accountable so we're like okay well we have to make them employees if we can do, if we want to be able to do that and that was a struggle man and I don't know how we can't get away with it in Seattle but well I, I know how I'm not a I'm not a billionaire yeah but. yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's pretty crazy though. They have to. I think they have to pay for their own health care. I think if they get injured, the company pays for their like rehabilitation and stuff, and uh, yeah. all kinds of wild shit. But they're also making like a shit ton of money, so yeah, I don't feel too sorry for them. So um, maybe we should look at the the drawing of you walking as a zombie. Did you see that one? Yeah, Alfred. This is Alfred Reed, I believe. Yeah. So why don't we give him some feedback? He asked for uh, he asked for some feedback. So Alfred here... Pull it back a he little does, bit. That looks actually just been, like you. That looks exactly like you. He's been contributing uh, to like the ISCA contest. And he's, nice. He, he's been at it for, I, I want to say maybe four years. And he's always asking for feedback. And he's always he's always trying and working you know, to, to get better. And I, I have so much respect for that. Um, what I love about this drawing is... One, I have one foot that's not colored in. <laughs> so I'm assuming that that foot has some sort of like crazy infection. Yeah, it's a dead foot. Maybe just blood clotting and there's nothing happening there. <laughs> but the likeness is good. The likeness is sound. He captured my, my mullet that I had for a week. Um, it's got a good silhouette. I know I keep saying that, but that's a really important thing. Um, things, Alfred, things for you to work on. Things for you to work on. I think you would benefit greatly, Alfred, from uh, using a marker or using a softer lead pencil mm -hmm. that can emulate thicker lines and thinner lines. Because a lot of what makes caricature powerful, is, is as long as, from a line work standpoint, is being able to modulate your line thickness and thinness. Um, so that would be the one thing I would say that uh, you can work on on your on your spare time. Maybe even trace over this drawing with a marker and try and try and make it uh, stand out because that's that's what it's all about. But overall, great job, Alfred. Keep drawing, keep pushing yourself. It's always great to see you uh, drawing. One thing uh, about the silhouette, actually, that he can do, and I'm picking this up from Stephen Silver's book, actually, is um, he can do straight lines and lines that go all the way through. So in your sketching stage, you can draw the line all the way through and follow it around sort of concentrically um, and see where those lines go if you continue them. And if you do that, you'll find like a rhythm that carries through the whole piece. Um, and it'll make the silhouette a lot stronger and it'll make, uh, it'll make, for example, with that piece, it'll make it feel like the weight is actually on the back foot. Like if you had a straight line from the back of your neck all the way down to the bottom of that foot that the weight is on, and then the other leg kicked forward straight, it'll make it feel like, you know, he's actually stiff and kind of like, like a zombie as opposed yeah. to if the line has even a little bit of a curve to it, like the mind immediately sees that as a, a different weight distribution. It's very, that's very good. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, uh, you have a question there? Yeah. Um, so one of my, uh, he used to work with me, uh, with over the line back in the day. He now does the fair circuit all over the place. Um, his name is Max Elam. So he said, do you think society's idea of what defines art and how it's all subjective has been taken too far? For example, if I tape a banana to the wall and put a price on it, or people that are popular and have convinced themselves that they make art because friends like it, but wouldn't last a day in the commercial art world. Did you get all that? Yeah, I got it. Yeah. Um, obviously, everyone's got a different 
conception of what's art, what's art to you is different than what's art to me. What's art to, you know, some Joe Schmo in Brooklyn is not what's art to some guy in South Africa. Right. Do I think a banana on a wall is art? Fuck no. I don't. I think that there has to be a certain level of work and design that goes into creating a piece. Whether you spend five minutes on it or you spend 500 hours on it. I think that you have to go in, you have to put in that work and you have to have intention behind it. If you tape a banana to a wall, that's not art. If anyone thinks that's art, they don't know what the fuck they're talking about. But then so, again, that's only my opinion. So, yeah, I mean, this goes back to, like, my disgust with, uh, with like, post-contemporary conceptual art. But I agree with you totally. Um, you've probably heard of the 4-H club, which I think stand, the H's stand for, like, home, heart, health, and ha- or home, heart, health, hands, maybe? Okay. Um, but... You can apply three of those H's to your artwork too. Um, the hand and your the hand has to oh that's what it is. It's the hand, the head, and the heart. So there should be a good concept. There should be good craftsmanship in it, uh, and there should be a passion in it. And um, that's I think what makes good art, um, and what makes good artists. And as far as the banana thing, I think with uh, post-contemporary and conceptual art, it's important to like look at the con, like the the context behind like what's happening. I think it's bullshit too, but it's not really art. What it really is is the guy who bought it. I think he owned like a he owned some kind of like media or marketing company. Mm-hmm. So if you think about like why that guy would have bought that piece, it's probably because it's going to be sensational and it's going to push the stocks of his media company up. And maybe maybe it'll be a tax write-off. But so, yeah, I mean, it's not art, but the fact that they're calling it art and the whole controversy around it and the fact that we're talking about it right now is pushing the price of his media company up. Yeah. (laughs) So it was definitely worth it to him. It's all going to be satire in the end. So I guess, you know, I guess in the end it will, it will probably 10 years from now, it will actually be defined as art. Uh, I had one more question. Yep. Uh, what motivates you and inspires you to grow or practice as an artist? That that's that's the big one, man. It's um, I mean, I have several motivations. You know, I have a family, so I, I want to be able to you know make money so I can put a roof over their heads. Uh, that's not to say that my wife my wife works as well, but uh, that motivates me to continue to get better because the better I get the more opportunities will come up. Um, there's still that, 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 what do they call it? Uh, there's still that, that thing inside of me that wants me to keep pushing um, and growing, which is why I've, I've kind of parlayed into more of a portraiture, maybe like an enhanced portraiture style. But I still love caricature too. And I, honestly... I'm motivated to draw caricatures just as much now as I was 20 years ago. Hmm. You know, I see, I see the work out there and I, I'm just completely floored. Like, I think the, the craziest thing about this whole quarantine is that all these artists that would normally be working at a fair, a festival, retail, now they're spending their time leveling up. Like they're, they're, they're not being complacent. Mm -hmm. They're actually like spending time working in digital or they're in the zoom meetups. Mm -hmm. But I I do feel like there's so many artists out there that are leveling up right now. And, and when they get back out there, they've got more notches on their belt Mm -hmm. that they normally might not have had if they were grinding it out eight hours a day at a caricature stand. Yeah. You know, they're not, they're not getting the fiscal benefits of it yet, but that's one of those things that's going to come in time. Yeah. Like I, I got a guy, uh, Sergio Mateos that he worked with me and Alani in Chicago mm-hmm. way back when. And the stuff he is putting out right now digitally hmm. is, is amazing. He even did like a collaboration series last month where 
they did the caricature uh, resolution thing. Yeah. And he would trade off doing the line work. And I saw that. Color. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or he would do the color, someone else would do the line work. And not only was I introduced to so many artists because of that, but it was just so amazing seeing all these artists just like growing. Yeah. These guys are going to be monsters. Yeah. It's fucking nuts. Yeah, yeah that <laughs> I mean, was I an awesome. A couple, um, Abel Aguilar, he's, he's leveled up. There's this one girl, I think it's Shut Up and Let Me Draw You. I don't know. Shut up. <laughs> yeah, her name is HR Likes. And she's doing amazing stuff that's blowing my mind. Um, there's, I, I know I'm just naming off people right now, but I feel like it's important to like talk about new influences. What is, um, what is her name? Uh, her name is Shut Up and Let Me Draw You <laughs> on Instagram. Um, I want to put these, I want to put this stuff in the link or in the video when I post it. Yeah, please do. I think um, I think you know these guys right now are are doing stuff that is a lot of it's kind of trailblazing too. Like they they're just taking bouncing styles off of each other. Um, there's Ash Stryker, who's got a comic book style, um, but she like does these like really cool diffusions, like that that kind of makes it look like you're 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 watching it through like an old tube television. Mm. It's like you're seeing her art through like a tube television. Wow. But it's cool. It's That's, like really dynamic shapes, colors, yeah. methods. Um, so yeah, I just wanted to list off a few of those people. Those are the people that have like really kind of like are leveling up during the quarantine where mm-hmm. I just see the things they're doing and that, and that motivates me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, send me, uh, send me a link, the links to those and I'll put them in there. And also yeah. uh, the links to that brush, those brushes you were talking about. Oh yeah, totally. That'd yeah, be awesome. I'd love to. Um, so do you have anything that you want to plug or any, uh, aside from, aside from your own Instagram and stuff? Uh, not the moment. Um, you know, just keep following me and, uh, you know, that, that, I mean, I can't plug my business right now cause we're not really up to much, Yeah. but, um, I'm hoping we can kind of start slowly getting back into the, into the, the mix, hopefully around July or August. I mean, it's not going to be what it was last year, but I'm optimistic that next year will be good. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And if any of you just want to talk about art, caricature, whatever, I, I really enjoy that. Um, you guys know where to find me and yeah. And then, uh, go follow Iska. Yeah. Cause it's great. I'm glad I got to talk to you, man. It's cool to get to know you a little bit better and um, hear from hear your perspective and your story. And yeah, it was awesome. It was cool. Yeah, likewise. And uh, next time I see you, you're gonna have to cook up one of those uh, cheese dogs for me. Yeah, yeah. So make sure that you subscribe, uh, hit the notifications, so you see all the videos that are coming out. And it's Nolanium. It's actually pronounced Nolanium, but I'll take what I can get. Okay. Yeah. Nolanium. You know, I got the idea, and this is something I tell a lot of people. Uh, I got the idea from my friend Jeremy Townsend. He goes by Jerk. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. It goes, it's it's good to have a tag. Yeah. Like, a, like a, it's, it's kind of like name brand recognition. There's other Nolan Harris's out there. Uh-huh. You're lucky enough to have, like, King Davis. Like, that's, like, the most bonkers you know, name. So it's like, no one's ever going to take that. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, um, I found like a Nolan Harris that was a lawyer a Nolan Harris that played for the NFL. And I'm just like, shit, you know, maybe Jeremy was onto something. Yeah. So, uh, he's yeah, so I, I, funny, I, man. He, he cracks yeah. me up. He's a, he's a, he's a cool dude, man. He's, he's fun. I love, I love to see him at the convention again, hopefully soon. Yeah. I think it was him. He made this video called How to Draw a Stick Figure. It got like 300,000 views. <laughs> Did you, you watch any of the other ones? No, no. Dude, they're insane. You mean? You're going to laugh your ass off. Oh, they're funny? Yeah, yeah. Because yeah, he, no, yeah. he did a live feed, man, and he just had me dying. Oh, my God. He's so funny. And that, and that, and that those videos were a caricature of some actual videos that were created 
God knows how many years ago by a fellow ISCA artist. Oh yeah. Um, he, I guess he got hired out by some company to make these like generic, like how to videos. Oh yeah. So he, would, he would turn to the camera and he'd be like, Oh, hello. I didn't see you there. <laughs> blah, 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 blah. And I'm going to teach you how to draw a bird. And they're just so freaking weird and bizarre and generic. And he probably had no place being there. Yeah. Just liking a paycheck, you know. But um, but Jert saw those. Oh. I think like a spark ignited. <laughs> it's just like, oh, fuck, I could do this so much better. And he did. He did. And yeah. there's like, I want to say there's like 15 of them. Really? Okay. I didn't know there were like a caricature of the of the actual videos. That's hilarious. Dan yeah, McMahon does yeah. that, actually. He does those like how-to videos, but he does his own thing on them. Who does the how-tos? Dan McMahon. Our you Mc... know, he's really good at that. Yeah, yeah. Man, yeah. that reminds me. I had a friend, uh, his name was Dan Boyer, and I was at a thrift shop or something i don't remember where i found it but i found this postcard that was like from the early 90s and it was like vote for dan boyer and it wasn't him it was just a different guy named dan boyer like running for congress or something <laughs> so i just like took a picture of his face and stuck it to it and like gave it to him for his birthday it was funny that's a hell of a birthday present right yeah there. good on you <laughs> so yeah man thanks for your time and uh vote for dan boyer and uh stay away from the sharona and yep. make sure you're uh, getting your exercise and hot dogs will do any last no words your order uh vote dan boyer yeah at least it is like a double feature so i'll have you and alani coming out at the same time cool right on all right by the way yeah. Fastest character artist 2012 right here. Oh, really? <laughs> you guys should have yeah. a draw off on... Uh, no, I can't keep up with that guy, man. He's, 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 he's too much too much younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> I'd, blow, I'd blow out my arm. All right, man. Well, thanks for your time. Yeah, take it easy, Sam. Have a good day. You too. There have been some accusations that another big name wrestler has bulked up artificially. I have to ask you this to your knowledge. Does Hulk Hogan stuff his tights? He needs to. His penis is too small? I've seen him in the shower. He He's needs to. He's got a little to. peeny.